God's grace, God's mercy, and God's peace to you from God our Father, the Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, God the Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier. Let me start off by asking you a question today, and I'm not actually looking for an answer. I really am not looking for anyone to jump up and shout out the answer. But here's the question. What was your worst day ever? Now, I'm willing to bet, I asked that question, and I'm willing to bet pretty much all of you to think of something. You all think of the, the worst day ever, or, or maybe a, a number of, of bad days. I'm also willing to bet if I asked you what did you do in response to your worst days ever, there would be a whole variety of answers to that. Some may say, well, you know, I really didn't do anything. I just kind of got through it. Others may say, well, you know, I really struggled, and I really wrestled with it. And still others may say, in my worst day ever, <laughs> I got eaten. That's what I did. But what does God's word say? And what can we learn from those who have experienced bad times and how God responded to them? Now today what we're doing is we're looking at one of the biggies in the Old Testament. We're looking at Elijah and his worst day ever. We're going to see what we can learn from him and the hope that we can have when those bad times hit. Now just imagine for a moment, just, just play with me, just pretend, let's just pretend for a moment. Imagine for a moment that someone showed up out of the blue and was able to prove, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that our God, God, Yahweh, the God we worship, is not real. He, he staged a miraculous event at the Washington Monument in D.C. and proved, proved, that God doesn't exist. And not only did he prove that God doesn't exist, he also proved that the real God that we should be worshiping is a God that lives in a golden chariot on top of the clouds and just cloud hops. That's the God we should be worshiping. And he was able to prove it. And after he proved it, this person then sent all of his followers out into the country, into the United States, to kill all of the Christian pastors. Put them all to death. In response to this, then, imagine if you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, ATF, CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, basically everyone went after this one guy with one desire, and that was to kill him, put him to death. To an extent, this is what happened to Elijah in our Old Testament reading today. Now let's set the context. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 19. To set the context of 1 Kings 19, we actually have to back up to 1 Kings chapter 18. And to set the context of 1 Kings chapter 18, we have to back up a couple of hundred years to King David and King Solomon. Now under King David and King Solomon, Israel was the world power of the time. You simply, you, you just didn't mess with Israel, especially under David and Solomon. You just didn't do it. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king of Israel, and under Rehoboam, the nation of Israel split. Ten tribes went to the north, two tribes to the south. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom took the name Judah. Now, from that, fast forward a couple hundred years, back to 1 Kings chapter 18 to Elijah's time, the northern nation of Israel had turned its collective back on God, on, on Yahweh, and they were worshiping a lowercase g God. The lowercase g God of Israel was Baal, a God who was believed to be the God of rain. And he lived in a chariot and hopped from cloud to cloud. That's who they were worshiping. There was a small remnant of people who still worshipped Yahweh, but not very many. They were the vast minority. Now, in response to that, our God, the, the real God, the one and only true God, Yahweh, was punishing the nation of Israel for rejecting him and trying to get them to come back to him by withholding rain. Worshipping the God of rain, I'm going to withhold rain to show you this is no God. This doesn't even exist. Return to me. That was the idea. Elijah, as God's prophet to the nation of Israel, however, 
was getting blamed for it, was getting blamed for the family, withholding of the rain. The king of Israel, Ahab, even went so far to call Elijah the troubler of Israel. I mean, think about that. He basically said to Elijah, you are enemy number one of the nation of Israel. That's what he said, basically. Now, Elijah, under God's command, called everybody together at Mount Carmel, a big and important place, just like the Washington Monument in D.C., and proved through a miraculous sign of having God send fire down from the sky to burn up an offering, that our God, Yahweh, is real. He is the only God. And Baal doesn't even exist. He's not real. He doesn't even exist. And then after that, Elijah sent people, sent his followers, to kill all the, the, the pastors or the priests of Baal. This is all chapter 18. Now, how is this, then, the worst day ever for Elijah? Because it seems like it's pretty good. He's proved that God is God. He's wiped out false religion in Israel. And as a result of all this, God's sending rain, so the famine is over. But yet the worst day ever for Elijah, how is this the worst day ever? Enter our reading. Enter chapter 19, starting with verse 1. Ahab, King Ahab, ran to his wife Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, who was a Baal worshiper, and told her what happened, told her everything that happened. And in response, the queen makes it very clear. Elijah now has a target on his back. And she says to him, you know, may my life be like the ones that you put to death, if I don't put you to death. In other words, it's my mission in life as queen to see to it that you are killed. She releases the forces to go after Elijah. And Elijah, in response, runs away. He ran away, and he got to the point where in the running where he finally laid down under a broom tree. He laid down under a tree. And did you catch what happened when you read the reading? Did you hear what he said? He prayed to die. Verse 4 of our reading, he said this. He's praying to God, and he said, Take my life. Kill me, God. I don't want to live anymore. Take my life. and no better than my ancestors. It was the worst day ever for Elijah. Elijah. Let's fast forward now to the 2000s, thus today. 2015. A loved one dies unexpectedly. Test results came back and something isn't right. Something showed up. The boss pulls you aside and tells you he liked you, but with the economy the way it is, he just can't keep you on. He's got to let you go. But hey, no hard feelings. We're still friends. It's all just business, right? Someone you loved and trusted broke that trust and broke your heart. And now you're not even sure how to go on, how to move forward, how to put your life back together. Not sure if you can trust again or love again. The worst day ever. Most can relate. Most have been there. If you have not been there yet, if you've not had a worst day ever, <laughs> God bless you. But hang on, because it's coming. We are broken, sinful people living in a broken, sinful world, the results of which are broken, sinful lives. The worst day ever will come. And doesn't it seem like it's more than just a day? Doesn't it seem like the worst day ever usually is more like a week or a month or a year of worst days? So what can we learn from what Elijah experienced? How can we apply what God did for him to us today? What, what hope do we have? First and foremost, and this is the most important thing, I think, no matter how bad our worst days seem, God is still there. He's still in control. He will not leave his children alone. Elijah prayed to die. Kill me, God. I don't want to go on living anymore. Kill me. Put me to death. And in response, God came to him in the form of an angel and gave him food. God wasn't finished with Elijah yet. 
And he was not going to let Elijah's temporary feelings get in the way of the life that God had planned for him. God is not finished with you yet either. God is not finished with me. God is not finished with all of his churches all around the world, no matter how things bad things get. Until he comes back to take us home, we're not done. And that's good news. That's an exciting adventure to be on because think about it. No matter what happens, even on our worst days ever, God has a plan for you and for me, a purpose for each one of us during our earthly lives, no matter how we feel from time to time, no matter what the worst days ever might bring. Our hope and our confidence is this. God is still in control, even if we can't see it just then. That's number one. Number two, let's take a closer look at verses four through six. Again, Elijah laid down under the tree. He prayed, I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. And no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Here's a second thing, second point. We need to rest. We need to take care of ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. On the worst day of his life, did you see what Elijah did there? Worst day of his life. What did he do? <laughs> he took a nap. He lay down, and he took a nap. He did it because he was despondent, because he was depressed. But the point is, he rested, and God validated that period of rest, even to the point of providing Elijah with some refreshment during the time of rest and allowing him to go back to sleep, go back to his nap. Again, here's a point for us. When our world blows apart, we need to have a rest-filled heart and mind. We, we cannot make any clear decisions when we're filled with anxiety and fear and sadness. And the same was true with Elijah. He was letting his own emotions and thoughts and feelings get in the way of the truth. He laid down and hoped to die. We need to lay down, if you will, and give our hearts, give our minds to the Lord, and let him minister to them. Let them be clear and calm. Going on, verses 7 and 8, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched Elijah and said this, Get up and eat. For the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Now it's interesting here, and it's something to take note of. What it says here is the angel of the Lord. Not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord. And that's very important. Whenever you read through the Old Testament, whenever you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord, that is always a theophany. A theophany means a pre-incarnate visitation from Christ. In other words, what that means is whenever you see the angel of the Lord, what that means is Jesus. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. Jesus came to Elijah. In the middle of his despondency, in the middle of his depression, in the middle of his fear, Jesus came to him, and he does the same thing for you and me, too. Jesus comes to us. Jesus comes to you, Jesus comes to me, and he says the same thing to you and me that he said to Elijah. The journey is too much for you. In other words, you cannot do this on your own. You were never meant to. You need me. And I'm here with you, and I will never leave you. The journey is too much for you. Let me nourish you. Let me nourish you. And Elijah ate the food that the Lord, that Jesus had provided for him, bread and water. And it was through the food from Jesus, the food from heaven, that he had the strength to keep going. It's through the presence and touch of Jesus that Elijah could continue. And it is no different for you and me today. Jesus comes to us. He gives us himself. He does it in the bread and wine of communion in one way. He also does it through the presence of his Holy Spirit. He does it because he knows what he said to Elijah is true for you and me. This journey is too much for us. We cannot do it on our own. 
but he comes to us. He strengthens us. He stays with us, and he gives us what we need for each new day. Sorrow may come the night, but joy in the morning. Back to Elijah. Did you notice what happened next? Again, going through our reading step by step. The next thing that happened on Elijah's worst day ever, he continued on his journey and went to Mount Horeb. What's the big deal about that? What's the big deal about Mount Horeb? Mount Horeb goes by another name in Scripture, too. It's also known as Mount Sinai, as in the place where God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments when they were wandering the desert with Moses, and all the other laws and all the other writings on how they are to be his people. I will be your God, you will be my people, his covenant with the people. Elijah went back to that place. On his worst day ever, Elijah traveled to the place where God first met with the Israelites and gave them his word. Elijah went home, if you will, to the place where he could meet God once again, lean on God and learn what God would have him do. Elijah went back to the beginning. And on our worst days ever, too, we need to do the same. We need to go to God. Back, get back to basics. We go to God in his word, what he's given us in his Bible. On your worst days ever, read through some of the Psalms. Psalms 4, 13, and 22 are really good ones. I like Psalm 13 especially. I don't know why it just sticks with me. You know how Psalm 13 starts out? You can picture in your mind somebody just shaking their fist at the sky and it starts out like this. How long are you going to keep ignoring me, God? That's how Psalm 13 starts basically. I, I like Psalm 13. Read through the book of John where Jesus reminds us who he is through all of his I am statements. I am the bread of life, I am the gate, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whenever you see one of those statements, one of those I am statements, underline it, circle it, somehow offset it, write it down, and then read through everything Jesus says of himself for you. Read the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter reminds us that Christians are a chosen people. You are a chosen person a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. See, we need to hear what God has to say. Both law, that which we have done wrong, need to confess and repent of, and gospel, the promise of forgiveness, of confessed and repentant sins and eternal life in heaven. Just like you can't separate the crucifixion from the resurrection, you can't separate the law from the gospel. They go together like this. They're both needed for us. They're both good for us. And God gives them to us freely in his word. Now I want to tell you that if we spend time in God's word every day, we'll never experience a worst day ever scenario. I want to tell you that, but I can't. It's not true. Even Jesus had his fair share of worst days ever, even his fair share of bad days. And I'm not actually talking about his crucifixion. He had other days that weren't so hot either. We also go to God in prayer, going back to basics, approaching him in prayer. And prayer is more than just telling God what we want. Prayer is opening our hearts and our minds to him and doing the thing that I think, I think in the Western world, in America, is the hardest thing for Americans to do. You know what it is? Be quiet. Stop talking. And just listen. Go to God in prayer and listen. Listen with our hearts. So what's next? Anything else we can glean from Elijah's life at this point that can help us, that can give us hope, that we can look at? The answer is yes. A couple more things. We find it again in the next few verses, verses 9 and 10. There Elijah went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have broken your covenant, or rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. See what Elijah did just there? Well, he opened up. He let God have it with both barrels. He didn't hold anything back. This is what's going on in my life right now. You and I can express our feelings freely to the Lord. God is big enough to handle our feelings. He's big enough to handle our concerns. The truth is, he knows what we're thinking and feeling anyway. 
We don't tell God what's on our hearts and our minds because he's up in heaven and doesn't know it. It's not like he's going to hear something that we say and go, oh, I didn't know you were having that in your life right now. We tell him what's going on to clarify it for ourselves, to enunciate it, to put it in action, to put it uh, rather in flesh. The interesting thing, though, is we find out just a few verses after this that Elijah was very, very wrong in what he told God, very wrong in what he thought. We have to be aware that our feelings are not always reality. Luther said, feelings come and feelings go. Feelings are deceiving. We'll get to that in just a moment, though. Continuing on, verses 11 to 13. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? On our worst days ever, we need to remember that sometimes God speaks to us in gentle whispers. We can't always expect the burning bushes and then the lightning and the earthquakes and the rocks. Believe me, I would love that. I, Michael Stahl, would sometimes love a burning bush answer to a question. It doesn't happen that way. Most often when God speaks, it's in the quiet, small voice of him in the midst of the chaos that we think is surrounding us. It's that voice that says, I'm here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I've got you, and I am not going to leave you. Gospel. What are you doing here? Law. Two more things. Verse 15, the Lord said to Elijah, go back the way you came. What? Elijah just literally ran for his life. He's an enemy of the state. The queen has all of her guards and all of her people out hunting him, and God tells him to go back. On our worst days ever, there's still real life. There's still real life around us. Yes, there are times when we need to rest. And yes, there are times when we need the quiet places. We need to be in God's word and in prayer. We need to confess. We need to repent. We need to hear what God would say. But we also got to get back out to real life, too, at some point. Inactivity feeds depression. And that depression, it often comes after the worst day ever. God had a task for Elijah that would give him a renewed sense of purpose. God has a task for each and every one of us, regardless of the circumstances of our day. Now, again, we go to him, we rest, we confide in him, all of that, but there's still real life. Ultimately, the biggest task God has for all of his children, ultimately, is to get one more person in the kingdom of God to reach one more lost person. Finally, last thing. After we experience our worst days ever, we need to do a reality test. We need to do a reality test of our perceptions. And that is hard. A lot of people don't like doing that because they find when they do a reality test that they were wrong. That they were wrong, just like Elijah did. Anyone, whenever we have feelings of despair, depression, anxiousness, anxiety, whatever, those feelings can color, can cloud our thinking of things. Our view of things will be colored by that. Elijah felt alone. He said, I'm the only one left. In fact, he said it twice. I'm the only one left. But in verse 18, God gave him a reality check. He said, basically, again, you're not the only one left, Elijah. You're letting your emotions get ahead of you on your worst day ever. The truth is, Elijah, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. We need to let facts shape our feelings 
and not feelings, shape, or facts. And here's the good news. We can't do it. It's too much for us. That's the hope that we have because the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit is here and he moves in his children. He is here and will minister to us. We will let him. We will let him. So what do we do with all this? Because in a few minutes our service is going to end. We're going to walk out of this building, go back to real life. What do we do? What are the answers? What hope do we have on those bad days and the worst days ever? On the worst days ever, we remember this, and here's the hope. God is still here, and he is still in control, and he is not finished with us. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to give our hearts and minds time to be clear and to be calm. And the hope, too, that we know and remember that Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. He knows the journey is too much for us. He knows that. That's why he comes to be with us, to walk with us, to give us strength for the journey. The hope, what other, what else, what other hope, what other thing can we find, can we do, we remember we need to be in God's word where hope flows. When we see the hope that God has for us, all in gospel, we need to be in prayer, and again, that involves listening. We need to remember we, we have the promise. We can express our feelings to God. There isn't anything that he hasn't heard or doesn't already know. We can go to him, be very real and honest with him. And be quiet. God often speaks in small, quiet ways. Finally, last thing in our worst days ever, we remember that there is what I call real life. There is other stuff out there. There's, there's work. There's a job. There's something we need to do. We need to get back to. We can't hide in a cave all of our lives. God doesn't want us to do that. He has a purpose and a plan for everyone. We need to get back to it. And in getting in the back to it, we need regular reality checks. Sometimes we can't do that on our own. We need other people to give us reality checks, other people who can come along beside us. Christ-centered community, friends, Christian friends, who will help us with reality checks. All the while, remember, we are not alone. Will you pray with me, please? God of Elijah, God of us, hear us as we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your promises that you will never leave us, that you will always be our one rock-steady God. Help us to remember that in our worst days ever. Thank you, Jesus, for enduring one of your worst days ever on the cross, being forsaken by God the Father for us. Thank you for your best day ever, coming out of the tomb and providing a way for everlasting life for all who believe in you as their one and only Savior. Thank you for your yet coming best day ever, the day that you return to take us home. Holy Spirit, come to us again and again and again. And give us the peace that passes all understanding during those hard times, during those worst days ever. Strengthen our faith and open our eyes to see in our ears, to hear in our hearts, to believe all that you have written in your word. Be with us today, tomorrow, and every day of our lives. The good days, the bad days, and every day in between. We know that you will do that because you told us you would. Help us to remember it. Thank you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.